Welcome to The Career Studio, a USU career services podcast that helps you navigate your career path. Thanks for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armistead, your host, and I'm so excited to have Welcome Sauer, a dear friend and mentor of mine here with me today. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here. It's nice to be here. Nice to see you. Welcome is a well-known manager in the agriculture industry where he has specialized in building new growth businesses. He grew up selling fruit at his family fruit stand and in high school started his own lawn mowing company that grew to over 100 clients a week. After attending business school at BYU and the University of Chicago for an MBA, Welcome went on to work in business development for Dole Food Company, where he was on the team that launched packaged salads, baby peeled carrots, and several new fresh produce items. He later became president and CEO of the Washington Apple Commission, where he helped launch Fresh Cut Apples. He helped start the largest marketing agency of fresh apples and cherries and is still associated with that company and its transition to fifth generation prosperity. He took a five-year hiatus to head a global division for Dow Chemical, where his team tripled that business. He has been called one of the best business analysts in the produce industry and has been a keynote speaker at dozens of conferences. Welcome has traveled globally for decades, working in over 50 countries and nearly every state in the U.S. He has been a board member for several charities, industry organizations, and businesses, including one charity that grants 400 college scholarships per year. He also served on the admissions committee for the University of Chicago Graduate School of Business for nine years. Welcome. You have some truly amazing accomplishments, and I am excited to dive more into that with you today. But before we begin, I would love to learn just a little bit more about your unique name, Welcome. Do you mind uh, telling us about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. My, my grandfather's name was Welcome Friend Sauer. And uh, our grandfather was named after a man named Mr. Friend, who, when my grandfather was born, stayed with the family during harvest in Nebraska one autumn. And so the family loved Mr. Friend, and in honor of him, they named the baby Welcome Friend. And then when I was born, I I got my grandfather's uh, name. I didn't get the friend part. I just got the welcome part. (laughs) It's assumed. You're a great friend. Well, I love this personal story, and I think it's a great lead into what we'll be chatting a little bit more about today. This month's theme is all about finding good mentors, and I have to admit that one of the reasons I asked Welcome to be here today was he has been a key mentor in my own personal and professional development, so I know he's going to have some great insights for us today. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So Welcome, would you mind just setting the stage for us? Talk us through how you ended up in the ag business. Well, I, my, my dad, uh, as if he didn't have enough to do, he, he worked <laughs> two jobs and then he bought an orchard on the side when, uh, wow. when he had a young family. And, and so he raised uh, our boy, us boys in the orchard. And in our family, for multiple generations, we have a pretty strong heritage of learning to work hard. And one of those families who just tore into work from a very young age. And uh, so I grew up uh, in, on a small orchard. Uh, agriculture always kind of fit. I, I didn't expect a Come back to agriculture, hmm. but actually, after uh, during the middle of graduate school, when all my friends were looking at Wall Street and and I was looking at brand management opportunities in big cities around the country, uh, I saw a brochure from the Dole Food Company and just said, "Oh, these people are for me. They they hire top tier MBAs and they work in agriculture. What better fit could there be?" So I I ended up back in agriculture. Several mentors had advised me over my educational years to get into ag, and I resisted it, and then. And hmm. it, it sort of came and found me. <laughs> I love that. And looking back, I'm curious to learn about some of those mentors. Would you mind, if you can, just off the top of your head, listing a couple of the mentors who maybe were instrumental in that process of finding agriculture or maybe within the agricultural industry? Yeah. So before agriculture really came education, when I was a, a boy, I, our, our home was highly dysfunctional. Very, very difficult home. I'm close to my father, but the rest of our family was was in serious trouble. And one day, uh, my cousin came and stopped by the house on his way home from college and saw one of those difficult moments in our family. And he went home and told his parents, we need to get that kid out of that home. And so they took me in for two years. And every one of the kids in that family were gone to college. My cousin became a Rhodes Scholar, went to Oxford, graduated there. And so I was always tremendously grateful for those role models. I mean, I I, I would I, I didn't own a toothbrush at the time. <laughs> and so there I learned uh, the value of education. It was instilled deeply in me by watching all of those people, especially my oldest cousin, who was uh, it, to this day has had a career as a scholar. Later in my teenage years, after I'd returned home and, and was kind of on 
my own entrepreneur millionaire in our town heard about me and you know this kid who could work hard and put me to work on a number of projects and jobs and businesses that he owned and had me in his home often he was a mentor to a lot of young people over a lot of over decades and I was his last one and uh, he's the one who helped me set up the lawn mowing business he didn't do it for me he just gave me some advice and took what I already had in the package of perseverance and hard work and tenacity pretty much told me how much rich people would pay to have their lawn mowed <laughs> how, to, how to do it right and uh, as a result I made more money in my senior year of high school than my dad did wow uh, but in every position I've been in, I've had fantastic mentors. When I first arrived at Dole, my mentor there was a mathematician and scientist who had been previously in the control room during the, the moon launch. And he ended up in the lettuce business by marriage. And he was tremendously helpful to me. He, he liked the idea of having a curious and a young intellectual in the organization, someone who could think and solve problems and get out and work. And so he was the one who sort of showed me the political landscape and kept me from going down paths that I might have naively gone down or working on projects that probably wouldn't have been successful. He, he just gave me a little advice here and there, but mostly he knew the political landscape. He knew who the winners and losers were in the organization. He knew how to avoid pitfalls. And so as a result, I think I stayed out of some cow pies in the pasture, so to speak, that he knew were there that I didn't know. You know I think good mentors know where the landmines are. And then he, he was a great coach because he could recognize my individual talents and put them to work with projects that would develop me and also help him at the same time. So I've been tremendously thankful for him. But there have been, in every position I've been in, there have been people who have, have really been willing to coach me and use my particular skills. And, and frankly, I didn't grow up in the greatest environment and we didn't have a lot of depth and professional education. So I've latched on to a number of people in my career as well and have asked for advice. And I've always found that when I ask for people are always willing to help experienced people want to help young people improve and do better so in addition i've watched and learned from others i go to church with a guy who's a former college quarterback and he just has these wonderful people skills really smooth a fantastic guy and a good friend of mine he probably doesn't know how much i watch him and learn from him he's had multiple generations of learning to smooth out the rough edges and so sometimes our mentors are people who we just admire and learn from and other times there are people we choose and other times they choose us and, and I certainly have had all of those experiences. Wow. I, as you're explaining and talking about those different mentors, I think that's so true that at different stages of our life, we interact with the people who we need to. I've always just felt that the people come into our lives at a certain point. And I think in my own life, you were one of those people who came at the right time and literally helped me find and make opportunities. So grateful for mentors and the role that they can play. Looking back at maybe some of those college years or early on in your career, what was one skill that as you entered the professional world, you didn't have? Have that you were able to develop throughout your career? Yeah, I remember there's a lot of people who go to business school do I worked in between college and, and graduate school. And it was clear into graduate school, uh, almost 30 years old before I really learned how to dress for example. Hmm. And I was accustomed to wearing a t-shirt all the time. <laughs> and I do remember some good friends who were had different skill sets and different upbringing than I did. One guy in particular said, we need to get you some professional shoes. He became a Wall Street person. And I tremendously appreciated that. My very first boss coming out of college, I worked for an insurance agency. I called on banks and car dealerships, every bank and car dealership in Utah and Nevada for two years. This was foreign territory to me. My first boss, one day he pulled me aside and says, look, it looks like you're, you're you kind of look like you're dressed to go to the river. <laughs> <laughs> he said, let's go, let's go take care of you. And so he taught me how to dress professionally and uh, how to feel comfortable in a professional environment. So much of that has changed in the, in the last 35 years since then. But we dress completely differently today than the suit and tie and vest that I wore back then. But I, I'm thankful that he had the courage to help me. And I had the humility to say, okay, well, I, I need to learn. So <laughs> let me take that advice and do something with it. And I did. Uh, and I've always, always been able to do that. 
Absolutely. Yes. And I agree. I think good mentors are able to see your imperfections and see areas of growth and then kindly encourage you towards that better path. Yeah. And so I just, I totally agree with that sentiment and love this idea of growth as a part of mentorship. Yeah. I, and to interrupt, I really think that yeah. mentors help us with the soft skills, the things that aren't necessarily in the job description. There was a book I read coming out of college. It's probably out of print now. It's called The Things They Don't Teach You at the Harvard Business School. It's all about the soft skills. And I appreciated the book because I didn't have those skills. And I've, I've appreciated mentors who've helped me navigate those soft skills, help me deal with the political environment, help me deal with different personalities, help me deal with my missing pieces in my own makeup, my own personality. I had a bit of a temper at, at different times in my life and I always put the projects and the success of the project ahead of people for many years in my career. And it's those mentors who helped smooth those things out, helped me become a better team player who pulled me aside, got me by the shoulders and said, hey, you'd be better if, if you, you know, if you did this a little differently or if you worked on polishing these rough edges. I love that. Yes. I'm asking all of the hard questions, I guess, but I want to know about one maybe life or career lesson that you had to learn the hard way, or in other words, you know, it was a lesson that you had to learn for yourself. Yeah, you know, for me, I grew up as an entrepreneur and didn't have a lot of discipline. And so, boy, I could go out and sell things. I would grew up on the fruit stand selling cherries and apples and peaches out of the fruit stand. I could talk to anybody. I could work hard. So as a result, you put those two together, you can become a multimillionaire easily. And certainly I was well on my way to doing that. But at the same time, I had such a hard charging attitude that I would bowl right over the top of people <laughs> and wouldn't even recognize it. Late in my career, I was well into my 40s. I was working in a corporate environment in Philadelphia at the Roman Haas Chemical Company that was later bought by Dow. So it was part of this Dow Chemical Company experience I had. The president of our division, who I worked for directly, we were in the process of turning that company around. It was a fantastic product we were developing. The thing was off, took, took off like a rocket ship. And, they, and so we were working hard and, and the company was growing. And he pulled me aside and said, listen, there's something you got to know. He says, I was helped because you know I had this personality like you did. I was charging hard and I was bowling people over and, <laughs> and, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't helping the team. And so he assigned me a professional coach, a professional coach. Wow. And I was so tremendously grateful for that. I was late in life. I mean, I'd learned the lessons previously. I knew I always kind of had that, but by having the professional coaching assigned to me by a mentor who said, I know this is going to be what helped you because it had helped my boss previously. I took full advantage when Went to every session and learned and went through all the exercises that they gave me. And that's where I learned to put people ahead of the project. And I, I didn't lose anything at all in the process. I just polished what I already had. So it was a tough lesson though. They were tough lessons. I, in the corporate world, I was a bit of a rogue. Entrepreneurs in the corporate world don't usually get along all that well. And so he helped me fit into the corporate world in ways that I hadn't learned previously. I love that. And I love that your mentor was able to give you advice based on their own personal experience. They didn't just say, here's a book I've heard that's great. You should read it. He said, this is what I have done to overcome this and then gave you that path. Love that. I have so many questions I want to ask, but I guess I'll go to this next one. So lots of USU students are interested in agriculture, as you know, and I guess I'm just curious, are there any tidbits of advice that you would give to students who are interested in this specific industry? Agriculture is a tough place to be a professional. It's a good place for people who have strong technical skills because we value them a great deal in agriculture. At the same time, it's difficult for a person like me who is an analytical business person because the, the industry is run by intuition. It has to be. Intuition is the result of years, decades of experience. And analysis is foreign language to a lot of people in our industry. I've always been fortunate to work for leaders, executives who craved analysis, who want wanted the intellectual side of business and I've been protected by those people. And so I've spent my career sort of combining analysis and intuition and turning them into business plans. I work for a large corporate organization, but there are very few of them. You know, the Dole Food Company is extremely analytical and very heavy on business plans and budgeting and capital budgeting and return on investment. Most agriculture companies are not that way. And fortunately, I've been protected by people who like the skill set, the professional skill set 
concept that I bring to the table. But we have to recognize most of agriculture are family-run private businesses. And so for those of us who are in the industry, we're either part of a family or we're serving a family. And we have to recognize that in family-held, privately-held, intuitively-run businesses, outsiders and people with business skills, again, might be just a bit foreign. We have to recognize that we're serving a family and we're trying to help them be successful in however they can be successful. It's difficult for outsiders to break in to the inside of the agriculture industry. And if somebody doesn't have an inside connection, comes in from the outside, they just have to recognize that we're servants to people who are trying to keep a multi-generational family operation together. Some of these family operations are very large. Yeah. But much of the objective of a lot of these companies is to pass that company down from generation to generation. Such a unique industry. And, and like you said, it's very different than I would say from just about any other. But what a cool opportunity to make a difference in a family, like you said, in, in this family setting. So I love that. I think agriculture is a lifestyle industry. I think most of us who are in agriculture recognize that. We have a lot of sentiment associated with the industry. We like the lifestyle. Some things you do because you're going to make a lot of money. In the agriculture, agriculture industry, we do it because we love the lifestyle. And for me, it's always fit. And I've been fortunate to stay in it. It's taken very good care of me. My friends who went to Wall Street made more money than I did. They look (laughs) at me though, and they want my lifestyle. They would love to live. They would almost kill to have the lifestyle. What are they envious of? I want to know. Oh, I I got a telephone call from one of my classmates one time and he says, you know, what are you doing? So I'm sitting on a packing line in jeans and a t-shirt and I'm working on a budget analysis and trying to figure out how to improve the productivity of this packing line. And he says, oh, I'd just kill to be able to go to work in jeans. Well, and for me, I live next to the mountains. I live in a beautiful neighborhood in a rural environment. I walk out my front door and I hike straight out my front door. My friends have to commute. They're in large cities. They're on airplanes all the time. And I've done all of those things for decades as well. But when I come home, I'm in a much more comfortable environment than many of my professional classmates ever got to see. That's so interesting. And actually that leads me into kind of the next question I had, which is how do you define success in your career? Because there's absolutely the monetary value, but then there's also the lifestyle and the balance of family and and all of that. So talk to me a little bit about what success has looked like for you in your career. Yeah, I grew up poor. So for me, yeah, I keep score. (laughs) <laughs> and I keep score. I do keep score with dollars. It's sort of a, maybe it's an impediment at times. But really, when I look at the things that, that, that have given me the greatest satisfaction, the things that go on the wall, they're projects that have been successful. Launching packaged salads was a big, big deal. It's a great project. To me, I look at the, at the growth businesses. That's always what I wanted to do. I grew up as an entrepreneur. So had we been able to make something grow and build it into something? That's pretty much how I have spent my my career. Now, at the same time, every chance I've had to make a career decision, and there have been many different opportunities, I tend to have always made a career choices on the basis of lifestyle first, as opposed to other things. I had, a, I had an opportunity six or eight years ago with a company in California. They wanted me to come and help them launch a, a new chemical product. It was right down the path that I'd been down before. I knew I could make that company more successful than they had been. They offered me a huge stock offering in the company and pretty good salary. It was a nice place to live, had good lifestyle. I just had this hunch something wasn't quite right though. And so I turned the position down. And two years later, I found out that the chief financial officer had cooked the books. The mm-hmm. stock price that was at $14 a share uh, today trades at a dollar one or something like that. Wow. All my stock options would have been worthless. And, you know, there's just times when you have to stay with your core. And in, in that particular case, I, I just had this intuition that something wasn't quite right, even though the other pieces fit. And there also wasn't really any other reason to go take that position other than the money. And so I'm glad I didn't do it. I've always wanted, whenever I've made these moves, I've taken them because there was a cause that I could work on where I could make a difference, where there was something that was valuable and worth doing. And so many of the things that I've done really fit that bill. It's, It's one thing to work for money. It's another to work with and for people you like being around. It's, it's tremendously useful and brings great reward. But greatest of all is to work on a cause, something your heart's really committed to that you can dig into every day. I went to work with a group of people who I just adore. I love them. been working with them since 2003. And we wanted to build their sales business back then. 
And they were into that. Their family needed that sales part of their organization to be powerful and successful. And so we all pulled together and worked on it and made it successful. And now it's become huge. The same people we're working with, they run it today. And it was a cause that I felt pretty much committed to because I could see it meant a great deal to the prosperity of that family. And we were all in it together. So there I got to work for the money. I got to work with great people. And I got to work on a cause that I thought was a good and worthy and noble cause. That to me, the package that's, deal. that's my distant success. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've always, uh, I've always wanted that triple combination and the things that I've done. The money is much less important when you start thinking about the cause and the people you work with. Oh, I love that. And I, I couldn't agree more. Well, welcome. We're just about out of time, but I would love to ask one final question. And that is, what is one piece of advice that you would give to students about finding good life mentors? I think it's important to, I think there's three points here. One is to recognize that people really want to help. They want to lift and help young people and, and they love to be asked to help. So therefore, ask for it. When you called asking me to do this, I jumped at it because I, I, I love to help. And I, I think most of us who are a little further down the path like to help those who are starting up the path. And then recognize how valuable it is to watch and learn from others. There are so many skills that we have, I have wonderful analytical skills, wonderful technical skills, wonderful professional skills. But th that's only a piece of what we do in the workplace. All of these soft skills, those are the things that we learn from our mentors and the other people that we're around. And if we're asked to coach, we can. We can receive that help. I remember one time serving in an assignment where I just was too busy. And the guy I was working with was busier than I was. And so I just sat him down one day, says, I need to learn from you as a person. You're a doctor. I'm a business guy. You're busier than I am. I have a set of twins that are keeping me busy. You have two sets of twins. <laughs> You know, I, I'm doing this thing in, in my life. You know, I have four children. You have eight children. How do you do it all? And he dropped everything, everything, and just gave me some of the best advice that you could ever have that doesn't necessarily mean anything to anybody else. But the, the point is, is that he wanted to help. He knew I, he could see that I, I was willing to ask for the help and he gave it. And we have to be willing to recognize we don't know everything. Somebody else is further down that path and we can learn from them. And for me, that's how I've spent my entire life. I didn't grow up with a lot of depth of background and I've just latched on to others and learned from them and asked for help all along the way and accepted help wherever it's been given. And it's turned into a pretty good package. I think our children now have learned from all of my experiences and they, I, I think, have a deeper understanding of a deeper set of roots than, than I had. But I, I got my roots from my mentors. My children got them from me and then from other mentors and they're probably deeper and more experienced than I am. I think over the generations, we continue to polish and refine generations as we go. Welcome. I so appreciate your, your years of wisdom and, and you're sharing that with us today. I'm going to try really hard not to get um, Jerry eyed over here, but I just have to share on a personal note how grateful I am. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I met you at a really critical time in my life, you know, because of you, so many doors of opportunity have been opened. <laughs> And that continues to snowball into future opportunities and future opportunities. And so just on a very personal note, I just want to <laughs> thank you for being willing to take a shot on a kid who <laughs> didn't have a lot going for her. <laughs> Let me interrupt you there, Marissa, because it's important for us to understand. Mentors, good mentors recognize good talent when they see it and they develop it. That's what they want to do. So oftentimes we're insecure. We don't understand what our great talents are. And good mentors, especially when they're given the opportunity, will recognize recognize potential and develop it. And they want to. And so I think we should all be thankful for people who, you know, whether it be the, the lady down the street, for me, my best friend's mother taught me how to hold a fork properly when I was 10 years old. I still remember the lesson. Or my friend Max Walton teaching me how to mow a lawn and then how to go across the street and price it with his rich neighbor. We like to return the favors. We love to see people with great potential. We like to see them develop because we know there's a great path ahead. And we like for people to be able to enjoy the path. When you start down the path, you can't necessarily see the end. For those who are further down, they, you know, they, <laughs> they, 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 they know where the pretty spots are along the way. Well, welcome again. Thank you so much for being here today. I've learned a lot and I know that people are going to benefit from, from you sharing these experiences. So thank you so much for being here. Well, happy to do it and uh, happy to be called on again if you need me. 
Thanks for joining us here at the Career Studio today. Please remember to join us next week as we continue to discuss this month's theme of finding your mentors for life.